So this morning we're continuing on with our series on Daniel, and we move to Daniel chapter 2, and it's a passage that I think, as I said earlier, is just so appropriate for where we are right now, and sometimes God's timing and His providence are better than we could ever come up with on our own, right? Let's uh, move to this passage, though, and we're only going to read actually the last half of the chapter, because it pretty much reiterates what was said in the first chapter, and I'll fill in the gaps later on. But starting with verse 24 of Daniel chapter 2. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the, men of, the wise men of Babylon. And he said, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you are lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know that the interpretation and the understanding, and, and may, that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked. And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, not by human hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer and the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. And now we will, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and, and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and beasts of the fields and birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, inferior to yours, though. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. <clears throat> Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly of iron part and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people, for it will crush all of those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered, him, ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. 
Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained in the royal court. Dreams are kind of strange, aren't they? I mean, we all have them from time to time. But you know how you usually can't really remember the details of your dreams after you wake up? I mean, it can be so real and so vivid and sometimes really even unsettling. But when you wake up, it just seems to fade so quickly that you can't remember it. Well, I had one actually a while back, and it was one of those. Right? It was just so real and so vivid, but also really unsettling. But I actually remembered to write down the basics, partly because I knew that I was preaching on this, and I, just, I thought this was really you know, good timing. But in the dream, okay, just for what it's worth, two of my closest friends came down with a really strange disease and it died overnight. And I found out about it because Holly had actually called me because she was back um, where we used to live, uh, trying to get the last house that we had bought ready to, and trying to get it all fixed up and ready to sell. And I couldn't believe, though, that this had happened all so fast to my friends. And as, as she was describing the symptoms, I found myself coming down with every single one of them. And then I woke up, right? But it was all so real, and I was trying to figure out for a second if I really had dreamed it or not. I mean, some of those times those dreams can be that kind of unsettling, right? Some people, of course, get really freaked out about it and feel like they have to figure out what the dream meant because... They feel like it has to have some deeper meaning, even though they're usually just based on our fears or past experiences as much as anything else. I just got up and had breakfast, actually. Um, and no, they, the symptoms were not those of COVID-19, and no, none of my friends or me have come down with any strange diseases in the last month. You know, but really, whether it's a dream we have, or whether it's all of the stuff that we hear about the future, and about what might happen, or about what people say will happen in the world around us, whether it's with COVID, or whether it's with the upcoming election, or whether it's with anything else, we're bombarded with this stuff, right? Because, I mean, the media is reporting 24-7, 365, and they always seem to think it's really important that whatever they have to say is going to have these great implications on what's going to happen in the future. And there are times, though, when we have all of this information and we, too, can get overwhelmed by it and we wonder, what is going to happen? What is the meaning of this? Is it that important or isn't it? And it can get to us. What does it all mean? And in that way, we're a little bit like where King Nebuchadnezzar was in this passage. He had this dream, and it had him all worked up about the future, right? And he, he didn't know what to make of it. And he probably had some idea that it was telling him something about what was going to happen in the future, but of course he didn't know what it meant. So in the verses just before our passage that we didn't read, he had called together all of his advisors, and he demanded that they tell him not only what the dream meant, but what the dream was in the first place. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was probably kind of young at this point. And like many younger people, he was probably a little skeptical about those who had gone before him. And especially, he seems to be kind of skeptical about all these advisors that had been advising his father, King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, and he could very well, just I'm surmising here a little bit, but from reading the passage, it seems like he could very well have been kind of wondering if they were just a bunch of smooth-talking politicians who were just in this business for what they could get out of it. After all, the food and the accommodations of being a, um, an advisor to the king were probably better than most jobs in the empire that day. So back in two, Nebuchadnezzar had called together all of those who claimed to have the more supernatural types of abilities of the advisors, the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. And if you remember from last week, the, the uh, astrologers were those who, from their religion, supposedly had the ability to um, read the revelations of the gods and the stars. Well, what Nebuchadnezzar says to them back then is, so, okay, if you guys have all of this supernatural ability to interpret dreams and tell the future, prove it. 
prove it by telling me what I dreamed, not just making up some interpretation of it. Show me this wisdom of yours. And as he put it in verse 5, he said, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut to pieces and your house is turned into piles of rubble. Kind of laying it out there, right? I mean, sometimes there's nothing like bringing things to a head to really get to the bottom line. Now this is, though, where Daniel comes into the picture. As you may remember from chapter 1, he and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the, also advisors to the king, so they probably fell into this same group of wise men who were being threatened here. But instead of going along the track of the other advisors and basically making the king even more upset by telling him that he was just being unreasonable, the four of them got together to pray about this. At this point, though, we need to step back a little bit and think about where they were. Remember where the nation of Judah really was. And there really was actually no more nation of Judah. They were captives in a foreign land. And, but once upon a time, under King David and King Solomon, and even a couple times after that, they had been the most powerful nation in the region. But now the temple and Jerusalem all look like something out of some you know, post-apocalypse movie. Basically, their homes had already been turned into rubble. So remember, this is the people to whom this book is being written. It was like, you know, they had been the mighty U.S. of A., and, but they had been disobedient to God and his prophets, and eventually God had seemed to have left them, they lost a war, and now they're all slaves in Baghdad, Iraq. Basically, Iran's not that far out of there. Or, I mean, Babylon's not that far out of there. How would that feel to you? But more comparable, maybe, to Daniel's situation in this passage, how confident in God's favor would we be if we were sitting in an Iraqi prison camp? Well, Daniel and his friends, we see, do still trust in God. And so... When faced with this grave challenge, they went to God in prayer. And the early in the passage says they pleaded with him to have mercy on them and to show them this dream and its meaning. And once again, God reveals to them things that only he can reveal. He answers their prayers and he shows Daniel the dream and its meaning. And appropriately, the first thing that they all do is to thank God for his care for them. And so getting to our passage, then Daniel comes to the king who asks him if he is able then to reveal both the dreams and interpret it. And Daniel is very careful to begin by giving God the credit for this revelation. But then he does tell the king it's the dream and its meaning, right? And it's quite a dream, right? Uh, there's this enormous, dazzling statue with the, the head of pure gold and the chest and the arms of silver and the belly and thighs of bronze and the legs of brutally strong iron. And then there's those unusually vulnerable feet made of a mixture of iron and clay. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that the gold head represents his Babylonian empire. So, does anybody know what the other three kingdoms are that are coming after this? Probably the most common interpretation or explanation of this prophecy is that the inferior silver kingdom is maybe the Medo-Persian empire that came shortly after Nebuchadnezzar and then the bronze kingdom was probably, that was one that was going to rule the whole earth, was probably um, the Greek empire established by Alexander the Great. And then the iron kingdom that would break and smash everything in his past was the Roman empire, which eventually became weak and divided. But there are also other good arguments out there that people have come up with. Some people say it was just the next three kings after Nebuchadnezzar. You could make an argument for that. Some people say that perhaps it was, you know, the, the Medes... Um, and then the Persians, and then Alexander. Other people say that it was, well, you got to think bigger. It was the Greco-Roman Empire, and then it was the Anglo-European domination of the world for the next thousand years or so. And then, and then it's going to be Communist Russia and China. And they all have really cool little charts and, uh, to, you know, to show that, you know, that they've got this all figured out. Of course, one of the younger people in one of my previous churches said, The Rock? Oh, you mean Dwayne Johnson is going to come and he's going to take down John Cena, The Undertaker, and Stone Cold Steve Austin, right? That's what this is talking about? Well, okay. Anyway, the truth is that there's been a lot of speculation 
about the different parts of the statue. And people get really focused on this. But after some, some extensive research into all the prophecies of the Bible and the prophetic interpretations, I have the answer for it. And the right answer is that it doesn't matter. It really just doesn't matter because the dream isn't really about the statue. It's about the rock. The statue gets totally annihilated by the rock and its remains just you know, disappear like dust in the wind. It's the rock that smashes it and fills the whole earth. And as verse 44 says, it's the rock that will endure forever. For the Jews who are hearing Daniel's prophecy for the first time, those three kingdoms were all basically other Gentile kingdoms coming in the future anyway. So what difference did it make to them who they would be or where they would come from? You know, one oppressor in the distant future was probably as good or bad as any other. They were hurting right then and now. Or then and there, I should say. And honestly, for us looking backwards, really? Those kingdoms are all pretty much ancient history anyway. It's easy for us to get bedazzled and distracted by this fantastic statue in this passage. And honestly, that's not too different from how easy it is for us to get distracted by the powers that be in our world today. It doesn't matter where they are, whether it's local or whether it's national or international. It doesn't matter whether it's our, you know, Navy's new super cool Zumwalt stealth destroyers with their laser guns that can shoot down bombs and planes and missiles before they ever get to the ship or our other, you know, Cool weapons that we've been developing with laser powers or or it doesn't matter if it's actually the fact that China and Russia got ahead of us in the past decade and have these supersonic missiles that we would have a hard time dealing with it's easy for us to get our perspective limited to the present and to the things that seem important and powerful now my friends what we need to see is that without God any great power in the world, any superpower in the world, is no more than just another layer in any of these statues, this statue. You see, the Jews who are hearing this prophecy for the first time probably felt pretty unimpressive compared to Nebuchadnezzar and his pretty dazzling Babylonian empire. I wish we had a screen that I could show you some of the stuff that they did. It was, it was really impressive for their day. But that's who was hearing this was these Jews. They may have had Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the king's court, but Nebuchadnezzar is still the king of kings at this day. And in our passage, even Daniel acknowledges that God has given Nebuchadnezzar the greatest dominion, power, might, and glory in the world of their day. And compared to that, the Jews' status as some conquered and dispersed nation probably didn't seem like much. And they probably really wondered what their future was going to look like as God's people. Well, how do Christians feel today? How do Christians in our country feel about being God's people in our country even today? Well, hopefully we'll feel a little bit better about it after this morning's message. But if we just look at the statistics of our country, it can we could worry. There's not only a growing number of people who are identify as uh, not having any faith at all and a decreasing number that identify as Christians. But when you look even deeper into the number, they're, they're worse yet. Only about a third of those who identify as Christians actually practice their faith. And only about a third of them actually try to live out their faith based on the principles that they've learned from the Bible in every aspect of their life. It could be sometimes pretty easy even to look around and say, see, see the, you know, the Christian lifestyle as being less flashy or less significant or less, less glitzy or less dazzling than the options the world likes to throw at us. The images that our culture likes to hold up of what our life should be like. And as Christians, sometimes we could almost feel like foreigners in our own land. But to us, just like the Jews, comes this message of this story. God's power is still greater than any force in this world. That's the point. 
The story is about the rock. The real power still belongs to God, and that was the hope of Israel, and it's still our hope today. Take a step back with me in the Bible a little bit. For the, and just big picture, for the first 12 chapters of Genesis, the story of God's interaction with humanity included all of the people of the world. First with Adam and Eve, then with Noah, and then even up through the Tower of Babel on that plain of Shinar, or Babylon. But then God deals with a narrowing group. He narrows it down the, the scope to just the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just the Jews. But here in this passage, in the Babylon, that back in Babylon, we see an interesting shift. The scope is getting broader again. It's looking ahead to when God's interaction with people will expand to fill the whole earth. And today it has. Even though there's not some son of David sitting on a physical throne in Jerusalem, the same God is still sovereign. And his son, Jesus, is still ruling over all. The, this God of Daniel in our passage has the wisdom and, and the insight into dreams, but especially into the future. Wisdom that surpassed the wise men of ancient Babylon, and wisdom that surpasses the wise men of any country today. This God may have given Nebuchadnezzar back then the dominion and power and might and glory, but as we'll see just in a couple chapters, he can take it all away whenever he wants. And all of the human leaders, all of the human leaders of every empire, of every country in the world, they are no more powerful than Nebuchadnezzar was. Whether or not they want to admit it or recognize it, they too are still subject to God. One thing we know for sure from that statue, though, is that even the very impressive earthly kings and kingdoms are all going to come and go. Even the mighty Roman Empire came to dust. But the message of this passage tells us that God's kingdom does not depend on any humans. God knows the future and controls the future, and he will bring his plans to, comp to completion through whatever nations and whatever leaders he sees fit, or through whatever natural means he chooses, or whatever supernatural means he chooses. And on whatever time schedule, he desires. You see, Jesus is that rock, born of a virgin, not created by humans. Verse 44 of our passage says that through that rock, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. It was Jesus' birth that brought God's kingdom to this earth, and it is his kingdom that will never end, even after all the kingdoms of this earth have come and gone. That's what we are a part of. You know, we see Jesus talking about this specifically. When John the Baptist's disciples came and asked Jesus if he was really the Messiah, Jesus' response was priceless. He says, go back and tell John what you have seen, that the blind could see, the lame could walk, the dead were raised to life. All of these were prophecies or I should say were signs from the Old Testament prophecies. And we read about them, or some of them earlier, from Psalm 146. What, that the Lord frees the prisoner, opens the eyes of the blind, lifts up those who are weighed down. What Jesus was doing was fulfilling exactly what God said would happen when his kingdom came to this earth. So for the Jews in exile, when they're first hearing this prophecy, this prophecy of Daniel is a powerful message of hope for them. Daniel was prophesying a new future, a new hope that they couldn't see before this. In this story, the earthly king of kings, Nebuchadnezzar, ends up actually bowing down to their God in this story. And their God is telling them in this image that he is still in control and that his kingdom is going to rock on forever. And for us, too, there is still this message of hope. I mean, at times we might be tempted to put all our hope in political leaders just to have them disappoint us. And we've seen plenty of earthly kingdoms, very impressive ones even, come and go since Daniel's day. And there may be times too when the church does seem hard pressed in this world. But we also have seen the coming to earth of God's kingdom through Jesus Christ. We've seen how his death and resurrection 
broke the power of death over humanity. And just that image, too, of his resurrection out of that tomb, just moving that great stone aside like it was nothing. You know, we still pray, Thy kingdom come, don't we? Now, Jesus may come back today, or maybe another 2,000 years. We don't know. But we still have more to hope for. God's kingdom work isn't done yet. It's not done in this world, and it's not done in this church. And he calls us to remember and to live as those who are members of his kingdom, first of all. We are first of all members of his kingdom before we are members of anything else, any political party, any country, any other thing in this world, we are first of all members of his kingdom. That is where our identity comes from, and that is where our hope comes from. I mean, yes, there, you know what, there's, there's plenty of work for us to do, yeah. There's plenty of us in this world and in this area who need to know about God. It is certainly still true that God's work does not depend on human hands to do it, but from what we see about his kingdom in the New Testament, he uses human hands to do his work. The hands of those who are faithful to him, like Daniel and his friends. And sometimes he even uses, well, even often, he uses people who aren't even aware of how they're being used by him. You know, for us it might be in little ways, like the ten volunteers from our church yesterday who went down to uh, meals for the Heartland and help package up 217,000 meals was the final count. And those 217,000 meals are going to be shipped to, uh, let's see, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, the Philippines, and some other countries that I forgot about, pretty much all over the world. God's kingdom may be shown through the ways that some of you helped out your neighbors, clearing up the storm damage. Maybe it's in the ways that we share what God has done in our lives through meeting people where they are and sharing our stories like we talked about earlier this month. Or maybe it's just being available to be used by God wherever he gives us the opportunities like we saw last week. And sometimes God may even put us in more important or more influential positions where our actions can have even bigger implications like he did with Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. God does not give us power or wealth or popularity for the sake of making ourselves great, but for the sake of honoring him like Daniel did and of being a blessing to others as well with what he has entrusted to us. Everything that we have, every ability, every resource has been given to us by God for us to use for the sake of his kingdom first of all. And when we look back at our lives, those are going to be the things that are the most rewarding to us to remember as well. Let's take a moment, though, to go to God in prayer and express our thanks to Him for the hope that He gives us for the future, but also for the opportunities that He gives us to make a difference in this world for Him. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that You would help us to lift our eyes above our, our present circumstances to lift our eyes especially in times when we are frustrated or when we're feeling oppressed. Lord, help us to look for the opportunities to make you known even in the most difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in. Lord, we pray that you would help your love and your grace, your mercy, your compassion to shine through us into this world. Lord, we ask for your blessing and Lord, that we do in your name. In Christ's name alone we pray. Amen.